We're going to learn what Ziegler Nichols tuning is, a more modern method called Ostrom Hoglund relay tuning, and then finally we will simulate a continuous stirred tank reactor to understand how these various tuning strategies work. We've seen that the complete controller uh, I equation for a PID controller can either take the Honeywell form, as you see in the, the thought bubble there, or it can take the gain form, the KPKIKD gain form. And it doesn't really matter which one you use. The idea is the same in both cases, that the controller should manipulate the control variable based on how big the error is, how much accumulated error there is, and you know how quickly the error is changing. Then you add some bias to it and you've got the actual value of the control variable and what it should be. So that should make some sense at this point. But we have a new problem. Whether you're dealing with KP, TI, TD, or KP, KI, and KD, you've got to figure out what values of gains to put in there. It's up to the controller to you know, respond to the magnitude of error and somehow we have to give the controller the error signal itself so that it can integrate it and differentiate it and look at its magnitude. But we have to decide as human beings on the magnitudes of these gains. Now that's not completely true anymore. There are self-tuning controllers, but uh, you need to understand where these gains come from and how you can arrive at them. So we have a new problem and that is that we've got this PID controller idea, but how do we select appropriate gains for good response. Well, unfortunately, one thing we will need is a measure of the size of the system. I always go back to cruise control in cars because that's something that most people have some experience with. Imagine that you take a cruise control unit from a really small car where just pressing the gas pedal makes the car respond tremendously, and you put that cruise control module into a Mack truck. And so the, the way, the sensitivity of the PID controller, it would be very high, right? Because in the small car, it really didn't take a whole lot of control variable manipulation. In other words, it doesn't take much pushing the gas pedal to change the performance of the car, to make the car accelerate or decelerate significantly. But if you put this same gained controller into a Mack truck, and the Mack truck's pulling a huge load, it's just not going to respond like the car did. In fact, you could probably mash the gas pedal or diesel pedal, whatever it may be, all the way down and the truck would barely begin to speed up. So to decide on the magnitudes of appropriate gains in the PID controller, we will need a measure of the size of the system. Think about it this way. Let's go to a water analogy. If you were on the water in a little small speedboat and you were to you know, go full throttle and you start moving the steering back and forth very rapidly, the boat's going to, to turn very quickly. Whereas think about being the captain of a cruise ship or I guess the pilot of a cruise ship. Imagine a huge, long, massive cruise ship they're not made to go very fast like a speedboat can. And so you take the wheel, I suppose there's a wheel, and you turn it all the way around. The, the cruise ship, even if you're going forward, is probably not going to really change direction very rapidly or very much. And so you can see the difference in size of two systems. So we need a good measure of the size of the system that we want to control in order to decide the magnitudes of the gains for the proportional integral and derivative terms in the PID control equation. Now, Ziegler Nichols developed a method for automatic tuning of uh, controllers, of PID controllers. And the idea was that they wanted response where, that they wanted good response. What do we mean by good response? Well, good response is fast response in the first place. So you don't want a controller that slowly but surely drives the process variable to that point. I mean, if you bought a Corvette after graduation and you were going 50 miles an hour and you were able to punch in 70 miles per hour. Let's just pretend the Corvette is self-driving these days. I don't know. I doubt it is, but let's just pretend. So you punch in, you know, take me home at 70 miles an hour. You're doing 50 right now and it takes 15 minutes to accelerate to 70 miles an hour. You would not be happy at all with that performance because obviously the Corvette has a big enough engine. It can get up to 70 miles per hour very rapidly. There's no point in waiting. So good response is quick response, a response that drives the process variable, in that case speed, to the set point which we wanted 70 miles an hour. So another attribute of good response is little overshoot. You wouldn't want your Corvette to go from 50 miles to 70 miles an hour and then continue all the way to 150 miles an hour before it comes back down 
to 70 miles an hour, right? That would be awful. That would be tremendous. It's called overshoot. It would go way beyond the set point. So the process variable would go far beyond what you ever wanted. That can be deadly in some situations. That probably is a good situation where you don't want to do 150 miles an hour unless you're on a racetrack and you probably better be very familiar with the track and very well trained and, and all these things. So uh, systems often in industry are worth even more than a Corvette. I mean, PID controllers control systems that easily are worth millions of dollars, if not billions. And so you don't want a controller that pushes the system well beyond where you want it. So overshoot's a bad thing. Continuous oscillation is considered a bad thing. In other words, what if you, again, let's go back to the Corvette analogy, you're doing 50, you say go 70, and it goes all the way up to 75, and then down to 65, then up to 75, then down to 65, then finally 74 is 64, and it finally, slowly but surely, you know, narrows in on your desired speed, but it just keeps oscillating above and below your set point of speed. The speed just keeps going above and below. That would not be very good response or very good control. So the Ziegler-Nichols tuning rules are supposed to yield a PID controller that has a certain prescribed amount of overshoot so that it can drive the process variable to the set point quickly. It is called an underdamped system because there is guaranteed to be overshoot, uh, at least you know in theory. The other thing is that it has something called quarter wave decay. What that means is that you're going to overshoot the, the set point with the process variable, but the next wave is only going to be one quarter of the first. So if the first one is overshot by 100%, whatever that is, then 25% of that will be the overshoot under the desired set point. So if you let's take the Corvette analogy and we'll make the math easy. If uh, you know you say go 70, go 78. Okay, then the next place it's going to go down to is 25% of the overshoot, which is 8 miles an hour, right? The overshoot is 8 miles an hour, 25% of which is 2 miles an hour. So it'll go from 78 down to 68, you see, because that's 2 below 70. And then the next one would be only an overshoot of a quarter of that 2 miles an hour. So that's what, uh, a half a mile an hour, so you go up to 70 and a half miles an hour and it would continue to settle out. So it settles out quickly. There's some oscillation, but the oscillations are damped out very rapidly. So those are some of the major features of the Ziegler-Nichols uh, tuning rules, but this part is not the tuning rules. This is measuring the system. You have to have some measure of the system. And in fact, the two measures of the system that you need are called the ultimate gain and ultimate period. If you think about it, the frequency which, with which a system naturally responds is going to depend on the system. I mean, if I take, I don't know, a car and I'm driving down the road and I yank the steering wheel back and forth, the car is going to respond fairly rapidly, right? It's going to move back and forth fairly rapidly. But let's take the cruise ship example again and let's say that I'm piloting the cruise ship and I were to move the steering wheel back and forth very rapidly of the cruise ship, well, it just takes a long time for it to respond, right? It does not respond very rapidly. So the the, the difference in the frequency of response is a characteristic of the system. It's one of the things that has to be measured, and that's measured by the ultimate period. In other words, the, the, the time required for the system to oscillate back and forth. But then there's also the ultimate gain, which is something that needs to be measured, and that's a measure of how sensitive the system is to changing the control variable. So these are the two things we need to measure, and that's what Ziegler-Nichols allows us to do, is to perturb the system in a certain way so that we can measure these two things. So how do we perturb the system? Well, we turn on a proportional only controller. How do you do that? How do you set up a controller that is only proportional? Well, just get any off-the-shelf PID controller and set TI, the integral time, to infinite or very large so that the integral term is essentially zero and set the derivative term to zero so that the the derivative term is gone and then you have a proportional only controller and then you increase the proportional gain KP until when you get the system to oscillate the system will oscillate back and forth continuously without those oscillations growing or decaying. Remember we're not trying to control the system right now we're trying to measure it. And so the system will oscillate back and forth continuously and never decay, that's then that, that value of proportional gain is called the ultimate gain. It's not the value we're actually going to use for the controller because it's too unstable. There's continuous oscillation. But it is a measure of the size of the system. And when the system is oscillating continuously, we measure the distance between the waves and that's the ultimate period. 
So it kind of looks like this. You have to increase the proportional gain until the oscillations don't just die out. If you look on this graph from T0 to T1, you'll notice that the oscillations are getting smaller. That's not good. We need to increase Kp. If we increase Kp and we notice that the oscillations start to grow with time going to the right, then that's too high and we need to, decre we need to decrease Kp. But if we finally find a value of Kp where say 3.5 and K and uh, the, the oscillations continue as far as we can tell forever for a very long time then that is the ultimate gain okay it's called KU at that point and we'll put it into our equations the Ziegler Nichols equations which I'll show you in a moment in order to calculate appropriate values of KP but in order to get information for the integral and the derivative term we will have to look at the time between oscillations, so the period between oscillations. And so you see there a measurement from 10 seconds to 20 seconds. The period of the wave is 10 seconds long, and so the ultimate period is 10, the ultimate gain is 3.5. We're not going to use those, we're not going to just put those right into the controller equation, but those are measurements of the system. And then the ziegler nichols tuning rules are these equations you see on the screen. If you want to stick with a proportional only controller, take the ultimate gain, divide it by two, put it in, and you're done. If you want a proportional plus integral controller but no derivative action, then take the ultimate gain, divide it by 2.2, put that in as Kp, and take the ultimate period, that time, that 10 seconds, divide it by 1.2, put that in as Ti. On the other hand, if you want full PID action, you want the controller to respond to the magnitude of error, the integral of error, and the rate of change of error, then you see the equations at the bottom, the bottom row, for calculating KP, TI, and TD. And notice that all these calculations are based on the ultimate gain and ultimate period. Now, using ostrom hoglin's measurement method is kind of like taking a sports car out for a drive because usually the processes that these things control are pretty expensive processes taking a sports car like a Ferrari out for a drive and just to see how the steering handles you take the wheel and you yank it all the way to the left and then all the way to the right back and forth back and forth just to get the thing to oscillate and oh by the way it might start to oscillate too much right the oscillations might start growing and so we shouldn't turn the steering wheel quite so far but we certainly want it to just keep swerving all over the road that's what using the Ziegler Nichols measure measurement method is like. Needless to say, this is not a particularly uh, practical thing to do when you're trying to tune a real process. What's used instead is something called ostrom hoglin relay tuning. This is very common and is built into most controllers. Instead of using a proportional only controller to measure the system and get the ultimate gain and ultimate period, ostrom hoglin wrote a paper that shows mathematically you can get very close to the ultimate gain and period uh, by instead of you know, cre increase an import proportional gain to the system to the point of instability instead using a relay that's not really turning the thing on and off but is switching the control variable between two set points one above and one below what is necessary for the process to hit the set point this would be well I've got an example for you in a moment but you can see the graphs here on the bottom graph on the left there is a control variable signal and you can see that the control variable doesn't go all the way off it goes to 40 percent and then once the system process variable in the upper graph uh, goes above the set point well then the the control variable is changed or uh, when it goes below I'm sorry when it goes below the set point then the system is turned on if you will but it's not full on it's 80 percent in this case and then when the 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 system responds with the process variable going above the set point you see the yellow line going above the green there then the control variable is put down to the low level, in this case 40%. Now if the control variable was set at 60% and just stayed there, apparently this process, the, the, the process variable, would hit the set point. And it would be fine, but we're trying to measure the size of the system so we can get good, so-called good, PID gains. Now notice that you as the tuner get to select how big a control variable variation you want. This is akin to saying, back to our Ferrari or Lamborghini or whatever we're test driving, I'm not going to turn the steering wheel all the way to the left. That's not necessary. As a matter of fact, if you've ever test driven a car, you've probably done this, 
where you've taken the steering wheel and you've just moved it back and forth a little bit just to see kind of how the car responds. Not so much you're going to swerve off the road, but just enough so that you can see how, how tight the steering is, right, or how heavy it is. You can see how the car responds to that control variable uh, input. And so the nice thing about this is you can start with a really small change in amplitude, right? You don't have to turn the steering wheel very far. You can start with a really small amplitude and see how the system responds. And if it responds okay, you might try a little bit higher amplitude just to get a better feel for the steering. And that's basically what this system does. So you have to decide on the amplitude of the control variable. In this case, 20% has been selected. Notice that from 40% to 80% is a total of 40% change. But the amplitude A is half of that, so it's an amplitude of 20%. That's actually what goes into this equation on the right. And then the system's response, how much the system overshoots above and below the set point, is essentially two times the error. So the error signal E is the overshoot above the set point of the process variable. So you'll notice in this case it's been measured as 0.8 percent peak to peak. So half of that for the error E would be 0.8 percent. So what we would put into this equation is a control variable amplitude A in the numerator of 20 percent and in the denominator for E we'd put 0.4 percent. And then KU to a good approximation would give us the value of the ultimate gain of the system. What Ostrom Hoglin also showed is that the period of the control variable or of the system gives you a good approximation to the ultimate period of the system as well. Now this is extremely valuable because it allows us to measure the size of a system without taking the system to the edge of instability and perhaps falling off that cliff. So let's take a more practical example. Let's say uh, that we're just trying to tune a cruise control system and we'd like to see how the gas pedal affects the speed of the car. We're going to use the same numbers from the last slide and how, well, what are the steps for using Ostrom Hogland relay tuning? Well, first things first, you've got to find the right value of the control variable so that the process variable is a set point. So let's just say we want to do 50 miles an hour, okay? And if we wanted, and I probably should have changed this, it should match the graph. The graph shows 40 miles an hour. That's the process variable. But for the sake of the slide, let's just pretend that the y-axis on that graph shows 50 miles an hour. We'll add 10 to everything on the y-axis of the, the upper graph, okay? And so what we're going to do is allow the on-off controller to change the gas pedal position around the nominal position we found. And let's say we're going to have plus minus 10% of full travel. Now, what's shown here in the control variable is a plus minus 20%. Okay. Now, if we allow the... So, so we know the gas pedal needs to be down by, I don't know, let's say 20 degrees. Okay. So what we're going to do is allow the gas pedal to vary around that 20 degree set point, if you, not set point, but that 20 degree setting, because the set point has to do with the speed, not the control variable. But we're going to allow it to vary around that 20 degree uh, control variable setting by plus minus 10 percent of the full range of travel. So whatever the pedal can do from all the way let go to all the way down to the floor, whatever 10 percent of that is, we're going to allow plus minus 10 percent around that, that 20 degree angle setting. And then what we'll do is you know, if, the, if we put the pedal, uh, you know, plus 10% beyond the, the desired, uh, you know, control variable setting, that 20 degree setting, as soon as the car starts going more than 50 miles per hour, we let the pedal go back down to 10% below that 20 degree angle. And then the car speed will start to drop off, right? And we'll eventually start to go below our set point of 50 miles an hour. As soon as we see it go below, we'll take the pedal and push it back down to you know, 10% beyond the 20 degree position of the pedal in order to just see how the car responds. Now you can imagine that if the car is a very big heavy with, you know, weak engine, it's going to take quite a while for that car to achieve the set point and then come back down. So its period is going to be much longer than say a car that has a higher power to weight ratio. So then all we really need to do is just measure how much the speed varied above and below the set point. And of course, remember that we chose a plus minus 10% uh, of full travel variation around the, the bias position, the nominal set point, the nominal control var uh, value. And we can calculate everything. So let's say the maximum reading on the speedometer is 120 miles an hour and the minimum is zero and the car can actually accomplish this. And let's just say that the car accomplished 
a 45 to 55 mile per hour variation, okay? The pedal went down 20 degrees plus, 10%, and by the time the car got to 50 miles an hour and we let, it, let the gas pedal off, the car overshot all the way to 55 miles an hour, okay? And then, you know, as the car came back down to 50 miles an hour, we pushed the pedal back down to the 20 degree plus 10%, the car undershot to 45 miles an hour before it started coming back up because it takes a while for this car to respond. In that case, to calculate the error, remember the error and the amplitude of the control variable both have to be in percentage. Percentage of full range. So we have to know what the full capability of the system is. What's the full range potential that we're going to use? And so in our case, the full range potential is 120 miles an hour to zero miles per hour, right? We're not including reverse because of course we're tuning this for forward, not for reverse gear. So the car responded with an error of from 45 to 55 miles per hour, but we want that range as a percentage, so we take it divided by the full range the car is, is capable of, so times 100% to get it in a percentage, but then we got to divide by two because notice we've measured peak to peak and we need half of that amplitude for our error signal. If you do the math, that comes out to about 4.17%. Then uh, the ultimate period is simply the time from one peak to the next, either off of the, the speed varying around the set point or the control variable, how often it moved back and forth. And in our case, uh, we would just uh, measure that, that ultimate period, and then um, use it in the equations. Now, to calculate the ultimate gain, we don't actually need the ultimate period. We need the ultimate period for later, along with the ultimate gain, in order to calculate appropriate gains for the proportional integral and derivative terms. So if we plug the variation of the control variable, which was plus minus 10% into the equation on the right, and the error of 4.17% in, well then, we come out with an ultimate gain of 3.05 or so, and we'd have to measure the, the amount of time between the various peaks of either the control signal or the response. And then we go and use the Ziegler-Nichols tuning rules with the ultimate gain and ultimate period. Now, just for the sake of completeness, if, we were, if the graphs on the left were our actual experiment, how would the calculation go in that case? Well, of course, there, the amplitude of the control variable variation is 20%. You can see that from the graph because it goes from 40 up to 80. Half of that range is 20%. The response of the system is uh, above and below by about 0.8%. So half of that range is 0.4%. I didn't finish the math. You can tap it into your calculator if you want. A really important point here is that the system's response in error has to be as a percentage. And the amplitude of the control variable has to be a percentage as well before you can plug them into these equations. So in summary, PID controllers have to be tuned. You have to select gains based on a measure of the process that is to be controlled. PID controllers don't typically come with gains preset that are perfect for every scenario. That doesn't work. Now some, some controllers are self-tuning in that you can either press a button and have it tune the system with some prescribed amplitude of variation so you don't blow up the process in the pro, you know, and try to measure it. Uh, some are self-tuning in the sense that they monitor the signal over time and try to adjust gains accordingly. Um, but basically, anytime you want to implement a PID controller, you've got to set the gains before it can do anything, uh, and, or do anything well, at least. For the sake of your laboratory, I have included the equations and methods, uh, the Ziegler-Nichols method and the ostrom hogland relay tuning method, um, on this slide for your, your reference. Uh, the idea is to remember that you're supposed to measure the period between waveforms and, and come up with the ultimate gain so that you can use the equations in the lower right hand corner of this slide.